Well, welcome to this workshop. This is the Undiluted Gospel and Preaching the Whole Truth. That's the name of this workshop. Well, my name is Travis Arnold, and I am one of the professors at Portland Bible College, which is a ministry of Manor House. And uh, I, I have the privilege of teaching this session this morning. They asked me what I wanted to, to teach on, and it was a very easy decision for me because it's something that's passionate. I think it must be passionate to any leader, any preacher, any pastor, and that's the gospel. And the gospel is one of those things that is very simple. By definition, it's simple. You can overcomplicate it and make it, make it unapproachable. You can overcomplicate it and make it un, not understandable. On the other hand, there is, a, there is a certain complexity about it. You can't get it wrong. Baking cookies is simple, but you can't get the recipe wrong, right? Um, and so every, every year in my, uh, in my Pauline Epistles course, so I teach, one of the courses I teach is on the, I teach is on the letters of Paul. And we're going through Galatians, where the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about the gospel and defining the gospel. And halfway through, and this is a junior level course, I have all the students take out a piece of paper, they have to put their name on it, and I ask them this question, what is the gospel? And I say, I say it this way, don't leave anything out that should be in, and don't leave anything in that should be out. And I said, treat it as if this is serious. Like, if you got this wrong, someone's soul's at stake. Because that isn't a fake scenario. That's a real scenario. The gospel of God is the power. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. So if we get something, and Paul can talk about a different gospel, a gospel that looks a lot like the real gospel in a lot of ways, but is different enough in a key area that Paul says it's not the gospel. So that's a, that's a big deal. And the students start to sweat, and they, and they write it down. And, you know, they... I'm sad to say that, um, oh, I'm happy to say many of them just have this brilliant answer. Sometimes it's too complex and they're going on with all these highfalutin theological words, which I'll try to avoid today, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, or, or, they will, um, or they'll leave some very important things out. And, and I know that if I got to like sit in front of them and question them, they would say, yes, yes, of course, <laughs> of course that part should be in. But, but think of it. You're up there giving an altar call. You're up there preaching to unbelievers or teaching believers, both need the gospel. Yeah. And, and you're, it's your job as pastors, as leaders, whatever, as, as Christians, yeah. to be a gospel practitioner. This is your job. Out of all the other skills, this is the one you have to be able to do in your sleep. And so that's, that's the idea behind this session. How is your presentation of the gospel if I were to sit down and grade it? And, you know, what does it matter if I grade it? I don't grade what my students give me. It's just an exercise to provoke them. And then from that moment on, their ears are perked, and they're, they're like, okay, yes, if there's ever a time to settle what the gospel is, it'd probably be now while I'm sitting in Pauline Epistles. Well, um, let's begin to take a look at what is the gospel, because I do think there's a lot at stake. And so if you're following the notes, that's great. If, if you're not, the first thing that we'll talk about is defining words. That's usually a good place to start because the gospel, the, the word gospel is a loaded term. It has a lot of meaning. The basic meaning, and I'm, I would imagine most people are familiar with it, what would the gospel, just, just the word itself, if you were like to take apart its parts in, in the original language, you probably don't know the original language, but you probably know the meaning. What does gospel mean? Good news. Good news, yes, good. That is what it means. Um, and it... It doesn't mean less than that, but it does mean more than that. Uh, the word in Greek, it'll, say, it'll spell it in your notes, is euangelion, euangelion. We get our word evangelical from it, or evangelism. To evangelize is literally to gospelize, euangelion. That's the word that gets translated gospel in the Bible, and the word is euangelizo. The, the verb is uh, to, to gospelize. Um, before we talk about what that word means in Greek, because, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. It's translated for us in English, thank God. But when you want to find out what did they mean when they said that, sometimes you have, to ask, you have to ask yourself, what was the actual word they used? But before we get into that, we have to realize something. The word had a meaning well before the New Testament started. Now, way back in the Old Testament, do you know what language the Old Testament was written in? Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic. 
Um, and so it's written in Hebrew. But by the time Jesus and the apostles came on the scene, it had been translated into Greek uh, long before them, actually, a couple hundred years before. And so when they're quoting uh, scripture in the New Testament, they're usually quoting straight from that Greek translation because it's just really handy to do that. When they translated it from Hebrew into Greek, there are some passages that talk about a, a key message of good news that has to be proclaimed in, in the Hebrew language. And the Greek word that they latch on to to say uh, this will be the word to describe what these prophets are talking about is the word euangelion or gospel. And so when Jesus and John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul, when they come on the scene saying, gospel, 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 you have to recognize they have a deep heritage for what that word means already. And it's actually not defined as much by the Greek culture and what the word would have meant in a dictionary, but it's defined by how it had been applied in the psyche of their scripture reading minds uh, in the prophets. And so in your notes, we have letter B then, how is the word used in Isaiah? Now, Isaiah himself didn't write the word, but when he was translated, they thought this is the word that we should use. And Isaiah uses the word a lot, and he's the main one we would go to. And in Isaiah chapter 52, how many like the book of Isaiah? If you're, it's, you don't know what's going on half the time. It's one of these prophetic pieces of literature, but it's beautiful. That's why it was, it was the most quoted book by the New Testament authors along with Psalms. And in Isaiah 52, 7, you find the word. It's there in your notes, but you can find it in your Bible, Isaiah 52, verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That's our word for gospel. You could say the feet of him who brings the gospel, who announces peace and brings, again, good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. I'd like you, though, to take a look at the context of that statement. And what's happening in the passage? And I'll frame it in for you. But you could, you, your eyes could just go down the page and see what I'm talking about. But beginning in chapter 52, the idea is this. God's people are in captivity because of their sin. They have rebelled against God, and he has punished them. He's made it very clear. This is not accidental. This is not, oh, this, is, this world is horrible and bad things happen. God's saying, I'm punishing you for the violation of the covenant. Yet, even though I'm punishing you, I'm not destroying you. I'm not, a, I'm not an enemy destroying you. I'm a father punishing you. And my heart and my promise was, despite your goodness, I'll always bring you back. And this is where he begins to unravel that. And so God's people are in captivity. And it says, you are going to be bought back, but without money. You're going to be redeemed, a word which means you're a slave, someone purchases you so that you can be free. But God says, strangely, I'm going to do it without money. And that kind of piques our curiosity. What do, you, what do you mean that we're going to be purchased, but with something other than money? And he says, when that happens, I will finally make my name known to you. Oh, well, we, we know your name. Your name is Yahweh. No, but you'll know it in a way you didn't know it before. And then he says this. In that day, I will make my name known to you. And then look what it says here. I think it's in verse 6. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one saying, here I am. Now, if you're reading Isaiah, Isaiah Lee, that is, if you're reading, if you've taken the whole book in order, where's the first time you've encountered that phrase and it stuck out in your mind? You might know enough about Isaiah to know that. Who, who's first said, here I am? Isaiah. Isaiah. It was the theme of our conference last year. Here I am, send me. And what's that passage? He finds himself in the presence of a holy God, and God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us to be our messenger of, of my purposes? And Isaiah says, here I am. And it's a very key moment in this book because Isaiah the prophet is being presented as a humble servant who will do God's will and announce his message. But you come to the end of the book, and Yahweh says, my people are under my judgment. Uh, they are in captivity. I'm going to redeem them without money. I'm going to reveal them my name. And in that day, it's me saying, here I am. I'll be the one saying, I'll be the servant of God. I will be the servant. I will come down and serve you and bring you back and, and be, the, be the announcer of good news. Now, that is a fascinating idea to consider. And so... What is, what is this? God is going to be the announcer of good news. 
So he says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring this good news. So this good news in some future day is going to be announced by God himself. He's going to be the one saying, no one else can do this. I'll have to do it for me. And he's going to be the preacher of the gospel. And what immediately takes place is this center of the whole book, is this poem about this suffering servant. And he says, let me tell you how I'm going to do this. And read down beginning in verse 13. There will be someone who is my righteous one, he's called. He's a perfect servant of Yahweh. And he doesn't deserve what he's about to get. But this is what it says of him, and we'll read it. It says, um, it says in verse 4, Surely your griefs he himself bore. Our griefs that guy bore. Our sorrows he carried. This perfect, holy, righteous servant of Yahweh who has come to serve him, we considered him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not even open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the hand, land of the living for the transgression for my people who deserved it? They deserved the stroke, the blow. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. That's a hard verse to swallow. The Lord was pleased to crush this perfect, gentle, righteous servant. Is, are we just learning something sick about God that we didn't realize before? No, no, keep reading. The Lord was pleased to crush him if he would render himself a guilt offering. So you can't just say, hey, Isaiah says the word gospel. Someday the gospel will be preached. No, Isaiah says Yahweh himself will, be a, will become a suffering servant on our behalf. He will purchase us without money. What is, what is it going to purchase us with then? His blood, the blood of his son, who doesn't deserve our punishment, but God actually takes the punishment we deserve, God's real wrath and anger against us. And this passage doesn't make sense unless you believe God has that and extinguishes it upon his own son, which he's pleased to do if his son would willingly offer himself as a guilt offering. And then you come to Isaiah chapter 61 where we see this phrase, and the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. There's our word. To the afflicted. He has sent me to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the, and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So what do we learn about the gospel here? Just look at those words in your Bible, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. What do we learn about it? We learn that the guy who's going to deliver it is going to be he upon whom the Spirit rests. And he's going to be anointed. In the Hebrew, that word is Mashah, where we get Messiah from. He's going to be the anointed king upon whom God's Spirit rests. And what is he going to do? He's going to bring freedom to people who are captive. But at this point in the book, we realize that while captivity might mean God's people are off in Babylon or whatever, it mainly means God's people are enslaved to sin, and apart from God's work, they have no possible way to get out of it. And so he said, once again, I myself will be the one saying, here I am. I myself will send a righteous servant representing me to, to take on that punishment and that sin so that I can bestow blessing instead. Now, uh, this is what Jesus quotes. In Luke chapter 4, he gets to the synagogue, he opens the scroll, they say, Rabbi Jesus, thank you for coming to Sabbath today, would you like to preach? We're hearing a lot about you. He opens up Isaiah, and he, and he quotes it, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the good news and freedom to the captives, and then he shuts the scroll and sits down, and he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your midst, and everyone was astonished. 
See, Jesus looks back at these Isaiah passages and he says, that's what I came to do. I came to bring the gospel. So that's the background. When Paul, when Jesus, when John the Baptist, I like to call him Johnny B because that's my personal private name for him. When they're, when they're preaching, that's what they have in mind. And if you were look at the passages where they preach about it, you'll see that they reference these things. Now, what about the average Gentile for the first time? This thing has gone beyond the promised land. Gentiles are hearing this thing about the gospel being preached. What would their ears perceive when they hear the word uh, euangelion, gospel? Because it's a powerful word in their culture. The word gospel was used in the Roman culture when a new emperor was born. And what would happen is, is that uh, heralds would be sent out throughout the land and say, everybody ringing bells, blowing trumpets, a new king has been born. And what this means, why you should be excited about it, is that this is going to usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. The reign of this new king is announced. And so when people began to hear that this gospel of Jesus is being preached, their ears kind of perk up. Ex excuse me? Are you saying there's some king other than, than uh, Nero or Tiberius or Domitian or... Or Herod, and, and you know, uh, y yes, and we're not saying dishonor those folks, but we are saying that a new kingdom has dawned. With the birth of this Jesus, we are announcing a new reign of peace and prosperity. Now, this wasn't done just so that you could say, "Yay, Caesar's born! This is wonderful." This was saying there's going to be a new prosperity and peace if you submit to it. Like you don't get to reap the benefits of, of the wealth and prosperity and peace that this newborn king is going to bring unless you want to participate in his kingdom. And this is interesting. This is why it's often called the gospel of the kingdom. It's not just the gospel throughout the gospels. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. This is the good news of the fact that a new kingdom has arrived. Now, the question I asked in your notes is this. What are the implications of this for us? I think... I think the Old Testament and New Testament vision of the gospel is not simply, hey, Jesus saves, that's the gospel. It includes that, but it's not just that. It's Jesus is king. And you'll find peace with God if you submit to his reign. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is not Jesus will save everyone. Jesus, just checking real quick. Yes, no, Jesus will not save everyone. Jesus will save all those who put their faith in him. He died for everyone. He wants to save everyone. He says, the Lord's will is that none should perish and all should be saved. Whosoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. But that means some of those whosoever you know, won't. And so, yes, this is good news of that Jesus is born and he's bringing a new kingdom and a new peace for those who submit to it and say, yes, I'm going to come alongside your kingdom. What else does it mean? It also opposes every other competitor, right? If you're hearing that, oh, there's a gospel of this Jesus fellow. He thinks he's a new king that's born, bringing about a new kingdom. That's interesting because what you're saying is you have to let go of the hope you used to put in Nero to do that for you or Caesar or, or you know, whatever, whatever we call the head honcho. You cannot hold on to the hope that this will give me peace and salvation. These men who demanded to be called Savior and Lord. There's only room for one on the throne. And he does not share power. That last part from Lord of the Rings, I think, but it's, it fits well there. <laughs> um, yeah, the, go the gospel says Jesus is here to save you, to bring you into his kingdom, but he insists on being the only one that you look to to provide salvation and peace and hope. And you have to let go of, I don't know, your own efforts to do it. You have to let go of, I don't know, um, these other idols in your life that would seek to supplant him. Well, that's the background of the word. That's the background. Uh, any questions before we go to the next part? Thank you. Can you state it as a question? <laughs> yeah, okay. 
let's, so that's, so I think it's important to lay that foundation. Why? Because when we go into these other passages that actually, because we haven't defined the gospel yet in terms of like a New Testament passage that says, <clears throat> this is the gospel. We just gave us, we gave ourselves the background for that, the things buzzing around that word whenever it was said. But let's look at a few key passages. So I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verses, uh, we'll just begin in verse 1 and we'll kind of hop around. So Romans chapter 1, okay? This is Paul's letter to the Romans. That's why it's called Romans. And this is under number two key passages. And we read Paul, he says this, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel. So he's about to describe for us what that is, the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets, yeah, we were just reading about that. In the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, that's, that's a big deal. That's the first time he zooms in and says, this is what the gospel is about. It's concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. We apostles have received the grace and apostleship to bring about, what are we bringing about when we preach the gospel? Obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom, among whom you also are the called of Christ Jesus. Let's skip down to verse 16, okay? And Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to whom? To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. For it is written in Habakkuk, the just, the righteous, those who are righteous, shall live by faith. Okay, we're learning a lot about the gospel here. What are we learning about the gospel? What do you notice about the gospel? What are the things that you're seeing from this passage? Go ahead and look at those verses afresh and tell me what do you see about the gospel here? Because this is one of those rare places where it's like uh, he's telling us what it is instead of just talking about it, assuming we know what it is. Yeah. Power of God. It, so the gospel involves the power of God. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. If the gospel of God is the power of God, there is no the power of God. I mean, there's nothing pa more powerful than the gospel to save people. This is fascinating. What it means is any of my efforts are going to only get in the way. My job as a gospel practitioner, which is all of our job, however we do it, is not to try to throw anything else in there to make it appealing. Uh, we should try hard not to get in the way so it's unappealing, but you don't have to try to make it appealing. You just need to get out of the way of it. Present it. Run over here. It's, it's like you set down a bomb, you lit the fuse, and you step back, and you just let it do the work. You don't have to explode. Sometimes people think they're the ones that have to explode when they're preaching the gospel. Ah! And you get emotional hyped up, and everyone comes and says, ah, yes, I want to receive Jesus. They don't know what it means. In, in the hype of it, we forgot to actually preach the basic points of it. No, you're not the one who has to explode. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. What else do we know about the gospel from this passage? Just little clues. If you get it wrong, I'll pretend that it's right, and I'll say, good, and I'll just move on, because I only mock my students publicly if they're paying me tuition. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's affected by faith alone. The word alone isn't there, but it's implied. Um, it's affected by faith. Luther put the word alone there. Um, and I think he was right because it's implied there. Um, it's affected by faith alone. Like, in other words, let me say it this way. It's received by faith alone. Like, it's not received by my believing and trusting in Jesus, plus I have to do X, Y, and Z. It's just, it, the just shall live by faith. Period, you know? 
Okay, yeah. So it, if the faith part isn't in there, then we're like really missing something, right? But by the way, what does faith mean? You probably, you guys are pastors and, and leaders and such. What does faith mean? What does it not mean when we're talking like in this context? Let me say what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean beliefism, right? What does James say? The devil believes and trembles. When we say you have to believe in Jesus, we're not saying you have to have a mental ascent toward a set of propositional facts. No one will be saved that way. What, does it, what do we mean in the New Testament when we say believe in him? What does that mean? Trust. Depe depend completely on. Uh, in our modern translations, it just had to go this way with English, how it works. It'll say believe in, believe in, believe in, believe in. I think there's only one or two times where that's actually stated that way in Greek. The preposition is believe onto Jesus. Yeah. Believe in is like, what does that even mean? Believe in. John, John likes this one. Believe into Jesus. That's interesting. Belief takes you into him. But Paul doesn't like to say it that way. Paul says, it gets translated for you in your translations, believe in Jesus. But what he's saying is believe upon Jesus. That is, it's not saving faith unless your life is built on him. I'm trusting in nothing other than Jesus Christ as my righteousness. Okay, so faith is important. It's the power of God to salvation. One or two other things. The righteousness of, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. And I think uh, Luther was also right there to say imparted by, imputed by, if we want to be technical. What does this mean? It means that by believing in what Christ... Let me say, believing upon what Christ has done for me, I am given his righteousness. The righteousness of God, it says. Right? So I am counted as righteous as Christ simply by putting all 120% of my faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm given his righteousness. Wow. Now, Paul will actually expound that more. If you missed it, like he spells it out <laughs> further. But that's his thesis statement, and he unpacks it in the ensuing chapters. Okay? So let's take two more. Um, one back here was, yeah. Talk about Old Testament prophecy. Yeah, that's kind of important. Like, we should be able to preach the gospel from Scripture, right? And what does he have in mind? Clearly, passages like the ones in Isaiah that we were just reading. And then one more back here. Yeah. Salvation is available to all, but it's only received by those who believe. Yes, very good. Because it is the righteousness of God uh, revealed from faith to faith, and it's salvation, verse 16, to, to everyone who believes. Yes, okay. How about this? It has to concern his son. You know, I've heard gospel presentations, and I... I'm, I travel all over. I, I'm not this big traveling person, but I travel and I preach and I listen and I sit in churches and I listen to podcasts. So I'm not picking on anyone particular, but I just notice sometimes you'll hear a gospel presentation and the word Jesus never gets mentioned. Yeah. Wow. And I have to ask myself, even if they offered salvation, has the gospel even been preached? Because Paul's first words out of his mouth after he gets through some qualifying, phrase, qualifying phrases is the gospel concerning Jesus, yeah. And so it's concerning his son, who's a descendant of David. What does that tell you about him? What is he qualified to be as a descendant of King David? King. king. Well, let's back to that gospel of the kingdom stuff. He expects this to be a submission to a king if you come to him. Well, there's more we could take from that, but that'll do for now. Let's go to another passage, 1 Corinthians 15, okay? Why don't you flip there? Flip in the script to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, and this is the only place where he actually says, this is the gospel, and then he like spells it out. The, the other passage comes close to that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand. So although he's defining it for them, he knows he doesn't have to spell everything out in great detail because they've already received it. So anything he says, you can assume he would have unpacked more when he originally preached it. 
But he says, by which you were also saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ, and this is where he starts up, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter's original name, and then to the 12, or given name by Christ. After that, he appeared to more than 500 people. He was resurrected, and we can verify his resurrection, he goes on to say. And he says, verse 12, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, and he's going on making a theological point that the rest of the chapter unpacks, which I don't have time to do, but the point is it's very important, this whole resurrection business. <laughs> okay, so what, what can you get about the gospel from this passage? Just right out of the gate, Christ died to save sinners. Well, he says it this way, Christ died for our sins. Listen, if we don't start there, we can't proceed. No one can be saved without a profound conviction about their sin. Because no one will reach out to Christ and receive his salvation if they don't think they need it. That is such a key thing to understand. Paul's audience understands what sin is. So he can just say that. If your audience doesn't understand what sin is, then you have to define it for them. And this is maybe something of why Paul said earlier, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because your mind might play tricks on you. His culture was as against the gospel as ours, if not more. And your mind might play tricks on you and say, I ought to be ashamed of this. This, this might not be received. No, it has to begin this way. We are all sinners. We have all, none of us have uh, achieved God's righteousness. We are under his judgment, yet he comes to us. And that's where it becomes good news. He comes to us. He dies for our sins. Christ died for our sins. Let's make this clear. Christ did not come just to free you from the effects of sin. I've heard gospel presentations like that too. This is a, this is a trick here. And some, sometimes you might not realize you're doing it, which is why we have this session. Um, you say, Christ will save you from your anger, your depression, your fear. And he will. But that's not the gospel. Christ will save you from your sin, not just the effects of it. It's a little more profound to say, oh, yes, I've committed sins. I've sinned now and again, but I'm really a good person. No, the gospel says you are not a good person. <laughs> And the good news is that you can believe in him, receive his righteousness, and be made a new person, right? And so, no, we have to begin with sin. The good news always begins with bad news. So he did not just die for the effects of sin. He, di he died for sin. The resurrection is obviously key. That's one of the things we notice here. Um, if he died for sin, but then doesn't have any living power to conquer death, to intercede for us, to send us his spirit, then Paul says, your faith is worthless. Good job. You got your sins forgiven. What are you going to do? You're going to get all screwed up again. That's all you're going to do. No, it's not just that he has to die for your sins. He has to die for your sins, conquer death and sin and hell, be resurrected, ascend to the right hand of the Father, always pray for you, send you his spirit, make you a new person. Like it, the gospel isn't the gospel if just Jesus dies for us. He has to be resurrected and everything that entails. And there's other things that we could, we could get from this. But let's, let's reduce some of these to some points. So Roman numeral three, seven gospel non-negotiables. We have to begin with this. It is good news. Now, I, I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, my instinct is always to zone in, zoom in on the aspects that are neglected and to emphasize them to bring balance. So if I'm presenting on the gospel, I'm going to say, how does our culture abuse the gospel? We, we, own, we preach God as Christ is a giant Santa Claus and that he's not angry and that he's not upset with your sin and that he'll come to cure the things that ail you and, um, and you just have to invite him into your heart. And those aren't false things on the face of it, but as a teacher, my heart is to emphasize the things that are de-emphasized in order to bring balance. And that's why I put this as number one, because you might be listening to me and you might be thinking, the gospel, I guess, should just be angry. That's just what it should be if it's going to be real. This is what this fellow is saying. No, um, 
We, it is good news. Whatever else you do, remember it's good news. Don't forget this. Now, it requires exposing the bad news first, but not, you're not angry about it. You're compassionate when you do it. You're not saying you're a sinner. And you don't have to just, you don't, you don't have to convince people they're a sinner. If you have to convince them they're a sinner, they're not ready for the gospel. Let the Holy Ghost work on them a little more. People who are ready to receive the gospel, they know they're a sinner. It needs to be declared into the atmosphere. It does need to be said, but not in a condemning way. God condemns them apart from Christ. Their own heart condemns them. They don't need you, and what do you matter anyway? Right? Preach the scripture. Preach the truth in love, but not angry. Compassionate. And, and make sure you do it enough to where they get it, and then get on to the, the best part, the good news. Right? Don't dwell, don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Okay? So letter B, it centers on Christ. The gospel centers on Christ. Don't leave him out. <laughs> and I've seen that happen. Don't leave him out. All of the good news is an impossible fairy tale without the real person and work of Jesus. If he didn't die on a cross for us, then God can't forgive us. And I stand behind that statement. This is political season. I approve this message. Uh, no, God cannot save us apart from Christ. Yes. That was the only way he ever intended to do it. And in his genius, that's the only way he could do it. And I'll explain this in a minute. Letter C, it invites us to submit to his reign of peace. My best friend, Ryan Harder, when he was first cutting his teeth as a preacher at his dad's new church plant, he gives this brilliant message and at the end of it, he has an altar call. And he stands up and he says, if you know that you're a sinner and you need Jesus, I want you to stand up. And he's like uh, five, six, seven, eight people standing up in a room of 60 people. And so that's, uh, them are good numbers, okay? And so, and then he says, now repeat after me. And they all repeat this prayer. And then he says, why don't you come up here? And they come up there and he begins interviewing them. What do you feel? Oh, I just said Jesus and Jesus. And, and then he gets to this guy, he's just sitting there like, angry. And everyone's like, what's up with that guy? But he raised his hand, he prayed the prayer, he came forward, and now the mic. And so Ryan says, and what, what, what is your experience? And he says, I'm angry. Why are you angry? You just ruined my life. And then he stomps out of the room. And the guy who brought him there had been working on him for a long time, and he was so angry at Ryan. He said, you, you had him stand up because he believed he was a sinner and needed Jesus. You had him pray the prayer, and he prayed the prayer, but he didn't actually want to repent and give his life up. And he actually treated those words more serious than many Christians do. Yeah. And, and I la we all laughed about it later, a little bit, but it was a sobering experience. And, it, and it's haunted me to this day. How many people invite Jesus into their hearts and aren't saved? If the gospel is the power of God to salvation and the gospel didn't get preached, then maybe there's not salvation. We don't get to define it, do we? We just get to preach it. And we better make sure we got the it right because it's all we have, right? And so it's the gospel of the kingdom. It invites us to submit to his reign of peace. Peace does not mean, in the Bible, home, I just feel so much better now. Thank you, Jesus, with your devos and your cup of coffee by the warm fire as it's raining outside and raining and raining, and I should build a boat. Um, that's what I feel like right now in Oregon. Um, no, peace, shalom, and have you heard the shalom? Shalom, shalom in the home. Uh, shalom means relational peace in this context. It's that you owe God something you can never pay and there can never be right relationship. And he himself achieves peace so that you can have right relationship. That's what it means by the gospel of the kingdom which brings peace. Letter D, it proclaims judgment on sin. Listen to Paul in Romans 2, verse 15 through 16. He says this, They show that the work of the law, the, the people who reject Christ, and God and his ways. They show that the law is written on their hearts 
because it's written on their own consciences, and their own consciences bear witness again them, against them. They know when they're doing right because they excuse themselves and they accuse themselves. And they know that on that day, and look at this, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. The fact that God will judge sinners is a part of the gospel. Is it not? You should check, because sometimes I'll add things to the Bible in front of my students just to test them. No, it's there, I promise. This is a part of the gospel. Christ will judge sinners. Apparently, the gospel preaches that God will judge sin, and no one is exempt or excused. Would we say that? Would, we, would you say that's a part of my gospel? If you, were, if you say, no, I wouldn't say that's a part of my gospel, then whose gospel is better, yours or Paul's? Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. And you were dead, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. He's talking to people who are now Christians. And he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's a very dire view of people. All unbelievers are dead at their core and are under satanic control. I couldn't get away with saying this stuff, but here it is in our Bible. Among whom all once lived, you all once lived according to the passion of your flesh, carrying out the desires of your body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. God's wrath rested on you. Yeah. Don't be angry when you preach this. Be compassionate and then preach the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages it might be shown the immeasurable riches of his grace and the kindness of us toward in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. See, Paul can't, that, that doesn't preach as pretty if you don't start with the ugly. You have to preach the truth to get to the, to, to get to the, good, to get to the good news. So how do we balance this? Letter E. How do, how do we make sure we are helping people see the, the severity of their need of Christ, yet also keeping it good news? Letter, letter E. The off, uh, it offers salvation through the cross and resurrection of Christ. This is the key. Keep the cross simple. What do we have in the cross of Christ? Isaiah prophesied it before he ever was born. We have this. Jesus Christ, God come in flesh, has perfect righteousness, willingly offers himself up for us. But what was happening on the cross? A lot was happening. Jesus was, what was, what was the cross doing for us? Well, you could say it's cleansing our sins. Y yes, it was. Yes, it's being an example of love to us. Yes, yes, it's that. It was conquering the devil. Yes, yes, the Bible says that. But there's one thing we can't miss because it's the central one. It was appeasing God's wrath. Yeah, come on. He put upon him the punishment due us. Listen, an angry God and a loving God are not at odds. I don't need to convince you if you're really honest with yourself. If you read the whole Bible and don't cherry pick it, you know that both of those things are true, don't you? We all know that. Even if you don't have never heard of the Bible, you know that about God. But what does he tell us is his controlling nature? He doesn't say, I am anger. <laughs> he says, I get angry and I'm angry not at sin, I'm angry at sinners. If he were angry at sin, he'd be insane. I get angry at inanimate objects, throw the freaking screwdriver across the room and cuss. Um, but God isn't insane like I get sometimes. He's only, you, you get, anger is justified if it's personal, not if it's inanimate. God isn't angry at sin. God is angry at sinners. But what, the, what is the overwhelming notion he has toward all sinners? Love. Angry is what, what he, how he feels and, and his disposition. Love is who he is. This is why the cross must be central. It is the only way that God gets to be all that he is. 
He can be completely just by saying, I will, I will judge sin. And he judges our sin on his own son. And he can be completely loving by saying, by giving you my son to take the punishment for your sin, I am also extending to you his righteousness and forgiveness. That's why Isaiah could say, God was pleased to crush him if he would render himself a guilt offering. The only way you, God can be God in the end is through the cross. That's why it's genius. And you don't have to, listen, this is brilliant. You do not have to worry about getting the theology balanced. The cross will do that for you. If you preach the cross, if you say Jesus died on a cross for your sins, you have thus just preached. You are a sinner and you need that. This is how bad you were. Look at Jesus dangling on the cross. That's God's opinion of you apart from him. So that if you believe in him, God's opinion of you can be expressed for what it is in his heart. You are his son. You are his daughter. He desires to forgive you, cleanse you, make you whole, and, and, and make you new. And so if you keep the cross central, you don't have to worry about your theological equilibrium. The cross does that for us. The cross shows us God is just, he's holy, he must judge sin. He's done it in the person of his own son on the cross. And therefore, overwhelmingly, he's loving. And you can never appreciate the love of God for what you should unless you picture it as the whole picture. Quickly to finish out, letter F, it is received by faith with repentance. Someone said, it's received by faith alone. Um, yes, I don't, I, you understand, faith and repentance aren't different things. Do you know what the word repent means? It means turning from your sin. Now, can I turn away from this wall without turning toward that wall? What does repentance really mean? Turning away from your sin and turning toward and trusting in Christ. You see, repentance and faith aren't different things. They're, they're two two aspects of one fluid motion. That's why there's passages that say you're saved by repentance, and there's passages that say you're saved by faith. And you're like, well, which is it? Uh, yes. And then letter G, it promises the gift of the Spirit to impart new life and power. So what would the purpose of this message be? Let's remember the thing that we all know in our heart and not assume everyone knows this. And when we preach the gospel, let's be clear. Let's be articulate. And let's keep Christ crucified and resurrected uh, central to that. Now, before I dismiss you, I wanted to say that some of the things that we're teaching today, we cover in a program that we have um, produced for, for youth pastors and youth ministries and churches called Prime. What it does is we recognize how how dire a situation it is when young people become young adults and they go to college and they leave our high school ministries, that the statistics of their falling away, and they're in a pamphlet that you'll receive if you want to read them, are baffling. And what we recognized is we need to, at an early age, begin to teach people the very things we teach them in our Bible college. Uh, things like this, which you would receive in basic doctrine or in my Pauline Epistles class. Um, and so we, these, are, these are videos, uh, like a whole video curriculum of teaching, and we'll end up having four years of it in the end. We're through two of them now, and churches are loving it because, because the young people, they actually are hungry for solid truth, and this is the only thing that's really going to equip them so that they don't become just another statistic. So if you're interested in that, please pick up one of the brochures as you walk out, and thanks for, for listening to this and taking away whatever you would.